ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد we begin in the name of Allah the most high the most gracious the one to whom belongs all praise and all thanks we ask him for his assistance we beg him for his forgiveness we seek refuge in Allah from the evil that is within us and we seek refuge in Allah from the consequences of our evil deeds whomsoever Allah guides and can lead us astray and whomsoever Allah allows to stray and can guide i bear witness that there is no being worthy of our worship except Allah alone the one true god without any partners and I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is his servant and his final messenger. We ask Allah to bless and protect his last and final prophet, his family, his companions, and those who follow his way until the end of time. Once during the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he was traveling, he encountered an individual by the name of Nafi' ibn Abdullah. And this individual, Nafi' ibn Abdullah, Umar radiallahu anhu, he had appointed him, he had appointed Nafi' as the governor of Mecca. So when Umar radiallahu anhu, during his travels, he encounters Nafi' one of the first questions that comes to Umar's mind is Man ala ahl al -wadi? that who have you appointed in your absence over the people of the valley? Because it was the practice of the governors, the Khalifa, and even of the Prophet ﷺ, that when the Prophet ﷺ, for example, would travel on an expedition or a journey, and he would leave the city of Medina, he would appoint someone in his place temporarily. So when Umar, he sees Nafi', he says, Nafi', man istamalta ala ahl al wadi That who have you appointed as a governor temporarily in your place over the people of Mecca? So Nafi', he says, I appointed Ibn Abza. So Umar, he hears a name that he's never heard before, Ibn Abza. He says, Woman Ibn Abza, who is Ibn Abza? So Nafi', he says, Mawla min Mawalina. He's one of our freed slaves. So Umar is even more perplexed. He says, Istakhlafta alayhim Mawla? That you left a freed slave in charge over the people of Mecca? Umar wasn't looking down upon Ibn Abza because he was a freed slave. But he realized that the people of Mecca were still fairly new to Islam. It had just been a few years since the majority of them accepted Islam. And the worry was perhaps they would feel disrespected. That how can a freed slave be in charge over us? It was just a few years prior in the, conquest, in the conquest of Mecca, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he conquered Mecca and he ordered Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu to ascend on top of the Kaaba and call the Adhan and still the remarks were being made. That a black man ascending on top of the Kaaba and calling the Adhan? Umar, he wasn't judging Ibn Abza, but he knew, he was scared that these people, they might begin to have negative, negative thoughts about Islam, they might try to revolt. So when he asked Nafi, he said, Istakhlafta alayhim mawla, that you left a freed slave in charge over the people of Mecca. Nafi responded, he said, Innahu qari'un li kitabillah wa alimun bil fara'id. That he is someone that proficiently recites the book of Allah and he is a scholar in the science of inheritance. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he immediately stopped what he was thinking. And he said, for indeed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told the truth. He spoke the truth when he said, Inna Allaha yarfa'u bihada al-kitabi aqwaman wa yada'u bihi akhareen. That certainly Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, through this book, through the Qur'an, He raises the status of certain individuals. Wa yada'u bihi akhareen. And He debases others. You know, they say about Umar radiallahu anhu, kana waqqafan li kitabillah. That anytime he was saying something then, and then he was told, for example, there's a verse that contradicts what you're saying. What you're saying is incorrect. 
and he would hear the verse recited upon him, or he would hear something about the Quran, he would immediately, immediately stop in his tracks and submit to whatever the Quran was saying and accept it as the truth. So when Umar hears about Ibn Abza, this description, إِنَّهُ قَارِئٌ لِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ He recites the book, meaning that he proficiently recites the book and he only does this because he has a relationship with the Quran. Umar, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرْفَعُ بِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ أَقْوَامًا The Messenger of Allah said that indeed by, through this book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate and would, will raise the rank of people. We live in very interesting, difficult, confusing times. It's either one calamity after another, one tragedy, one atrocity after another. If it's not that, we're being bombarded with ideologies and thoughts and beliefs that completely contradict Islam and what we believe and what we were taught by the Prophet ﷺ and what was revealed to us. But what makes us have firmness and steadfastness during these times as well as in the future is having a relationship with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's been about a month and a half since, since Ramadan ended. Our consumption of the Quran without a doubt has diminished and reduced. We don't hear it as much. We don't recite it as much. We don't come to the masjid and pray taraweeh behind the imam. If we do come, we come for Fajr and Isha. And if on that odd occasion, the Imam reads a little longer than you're used to, we complain, we say, Fajr was a little longer today. Isha was a little longer today. Because we heard a few more verses today. Because the Imam or whoever was reciting was in the moment, was engaging in the book of Allah as he was reciting and he was feeling it. And we were just zoned out because we didn't have an attachment to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a statement that's attributed to Abu Huray radiallahu anhu. He says, That illuminate your houses as much as you can. So you're like, okay, I'll go home. I'll turn on all the light switches today. But then he continues. He explains what he means by illuminate your houses. He says, That for indeed the house in which the Quran is recited, Literally, the house becomes vast for its inhabitants. Now, it doesn't mean the 500 square feet will all of a sudden become 3,000 square feet. But what it means is that the people in that house where the Quran is being recited, it's being contemplated, it's being pondered, there will be harmony in that house. There will be peace in that house. Allah's forgiveness and mercy will descend upon that house. The confusions, the doubts that the people in that house may be suffering, will be removed. How? By the recitation of the Qur'an, by the listening of the Qur'an. He says, خَيْرُهُ The goodness of that house will increase. That that house won't just be a good place to be in and peaceful and you get good sleep. But the good actions, the righteous actions that emanate from the people of that house will become abundant. And when that happens, he explains what happens. The angels will be in the presence of that house. Now, if all of that is happening, who doesn't want to be there? And the devils will leave. The devils will leave. Now, when we say shayateen, we immediately think the creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created that whisper to us. And that's what Abu Huraira meant. But nowadays, the shayateen have many manifestations through our phones, through our TV screens, our laptops, social media, whatever it may be. When we are not being educated, we are being indoctrinated. That we have to believe whatever society believes. That gender is fluid. That if you have a desire, you can fulfill it however you want. You can fulfill it with a person of the same gender, or you can fill it with an animal. Whatever you want. This is what's being spread into our own homes, our Muslim households. Abu Hurairah, he says, the solution is attach yourself to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because when you attach yourself to the book of Allah, 
You read about the stories of the prophets. Each one of the prophets, they came teaching Tawheed. But they also came correcting and fixing ills of their society. Incorrect beliefs. Whether it was Shu'aib alayhi salam who, who preached Tawheed, but also told his people to stop the financial exploitation that they were engaging in. Musa alayhi salam, he came with Tawheed, but he also came with the message to Fir'aun that stop oppressing Bani Israel and send them to me. And in the Quran, we find the story of Lut alayhi salam. And the ill of that society, yes, the message of Lut was Tawheed, but the ill of that society was sexual immorality. And again and again, in a number of verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that how Lut alayhi salam responded to his people, how he spoke to them with wisdom, but he spoke to them with principles and truth. Have you abandoned that which Allah has created for you from your spouses? And you're engaging in practices that no one has ever done before you. These are not just stories that we read, but these are stories that we learn from. You know, we, we hear about the du'as that are in the Qur'an. Whether it's the du'a of the Prophet ﷺ that we find in the Qur'an, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً Or the du'a, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا That, oh Allah, do not let our hearts deviate after you've guided us. Or the du'a of Musa in Madian, when he had nothing, رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ that, oh my Lord, whatever good you send down upon me, I'm in desperate need of it. All of these du'as are du'as that we learn from the Qur'an that should be on our tongues. Because righteous people before us said them. The prophets before us, they said them. But perhaps rarely do you hear about the du'a of Lut alayhi salam. And the du'a of Lut alayhi salam is even more relevant during our times. We're living in a society that calls this month Pride Month. We take pride in Islam. We take pride in being guided by divine scripture. We take pride in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put iman in each one of our hearts. And we take pride in the Quran. Because our guidance comes to the Quran. Indeed, this Quran, it guides to that which is upright. The du'a of Lut alayhi salam. Rabbi najjini wa ahli mimma ya'maloon. Oh my Lord, save me and my family, my progeny, from that which they are engaging in, from that which they are committing. This is a du'a that should be on our tongues, especially during the times that we live in. Whenever we see a rainbow, the first thing that should come to our mind, Rabbi najjini wa ahli mimma ya'maloon. Oh my Lord, save me and my family from that which they're engaging in. Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, he tells us what happens when the book of Allah is not recited. He says, وَإِنَّ الْبَيْتَ الَّذِي لَا يُقْرَأُ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ That certainly a house in which the Qur'an is not recited. And when they say recited, it's not just the mere recitation. But it's the pondering, it's the reflection. You know, it's embarrassing to a certain extent that we come across converts. And when you hear many of their conversion stories, they talk about that the first time they were given a copy of the Quran in English or whatever language, language it is that is their first language, that before they even accepted Islam, that from the moment they received that translation of the Quran, within a few days or within a few weeks, they read the entire thing cover to cover. And then it was like, then I accepted Islam. Or immediately as I accepted Islam, I read the Quran cover to cover. What's the last time you and I read the Quran cover to cover in a language that we understand? Not just the recitation, but the understanding. He says, Abu Huraira says, indeed, the, the, the house in which the Qur'an is not recited, يَضِيقُ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ It becomes tight upon the people that are living inside that house. 
You could live, MashaAllah, may Allah bless all of you and increase all of you. You could be living in a 3,000 feet square house, 5,000, whatever it may be. But yadiqu ala ahlihi means that there's no harmony in the house. There's no peace in the house. There's no guidance in the house. Everyone's on edge. khayruhu. The good that emanates from this, that house is very little. malaika. The angels want no part of that house. They left. They've abandoned that house. And if the angels are not there, there's only one other being that's there. The devils. The devils, they come in flocks. Because why? They feel like now we have found a place that is safe for us. Where we can spread our whisperings. Where we can spread our misguidance. What gives us steadfastness and certainty and understanding during the times that we live in, if these past few years have taught us anything, is that this world by its nature is unstable. Times are uncertain. The market is crashing, this is happen happening, that's happening. We're being bombarded with this and that. How do we keep ourselves grounded? Attach yourself to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not a message or a reminder for those that are proficient in reciting the book. This is a reminder for all of us, those that recite it proficiently and those that struggle. Whether it's 30 minutes a day or five minutes a day. Whether it's you reciting it or you commanding Alexa, that Alexa, find some recitation of the Quran for me. Alexa, find a recitation of Juz'amma. Find a recitation of Surah Al-Kaf and play it for me. But to illuminate our houses with the Quran. Not just because we will be rewarded for its recitation and its listening. But because it will give us constant guidance and steadfastness during these difficult times. أقول ما تسمعون واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده سبحانه وتعالى حمد الشاكرين ونستغفره استغفار المذنبين المقصرين ونصلي ونسلم على خير خلق الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. A scholar he beautifully said a recent day scholar he said كنت أتعجب من السلف but he says, I used to be amazed at the previous generations, the righteous people of the past, how for long periods of time they would just be devoted to the recitation of the Quran. You read some of their stories and you think like, how did they do anything else? How do they fulfill their responsibilities to their family, their responsibilities at work? And he says that, that they would do this bila, bila without boredom, without even being distracted. And then he says, رأيت العاكفين على الجوال, that, But then when I saw during my times, those that were devoted to their phones, constantly checking their phones, زال العجب, the amazement went away. And he says, I realized that the heart will always be attached to whatever it loves. The heart will always be attached to whatever it loves. Attach yourselves, attach your hearts to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the scholars of the past, they have said that we haven't seen anything that nourishes the mind and the soul and protects the body. And guarantees happiness more than just constantly looking at the book of Allah and engaging in the book of Allah. And that's why when a man in the past, he asked one of the scholars, he said, Kam naqra min al-Qur'an. How much Qur'an should we recite on a daily basis? Perhaps you've thought about this question. How, okay, I'll attach myself to the book of Allah. How much Qur'an should I recite? One page, five pages, or three lines? So when one of the scholars of the past was asked, how much Qur'an 
Should I recite on a daily basis? He responded, he said, Ala qadri ma turidu min sa'ada. Read in accordance with how much happiness you want. Read in accordance with how much happiness you want. We live in times where people try to manufacture happiness, engage in things, fulfill their desires or buy things that they think will bring them happiness. But at the end of the day, it's always temporary happiness. We have been given the means and the source to ultimate happiness. And that's why the great scholar Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali rahimahullah, when he was explaining the hadith Qudsi in which the Prophet ﷺ, he told us that Allah said that whomsoever shows enmity to a close friend of mine, that I declare war against that person. And then Allah said upon the tongue of the Messenger of Allah that my slave does not draw near to me with anything more beloved to me than the obligatory actions. And then he said, وَلَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلِ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهُ And my slave continues to draw near to me with the nawafil, with the extra actions. Now, when you hear the word nawafil, the first thing that comes to your mind or one of the first things that come to your mind is sunnah prayers. And without a doubt, sunnah prayers are important and they have a very high status and they fill the deficiencies in our obligatory prayers. But when discussing this part of the hadith, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, the first thing he says, he says, وَمِنْ أَعْظَمِ مَا يُتَقَرَّبُ بِهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ مِنَ النَّوَافِلِ كَثْرَةُ تِلَاوَةِ كِتَابِهِ وَسَمَاعِهِ بِتَتَبُّرٍ وَتَفَكُّرٍ وَتَفَهُمٍ He says the greatest thing from the nawafil that you can draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with is reciting the Qur'an, listening to it with contemplation, with reflection and with understanding. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of the Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the best of this world, the best of the next, and to save us from the punishment of the hellfire. A few announcements as I end. Tonight, the youth summer, fram, uh, summer Friday night program starts early at 6.30 p.m. with game nights for all ages. Special needs programs is, is hosting an information session with school psychologist Aisha Hussein. Also next Friday, IOC will be having their monthly Friday night potluck. Also next Sunday, they will be holding a blood drive here at the masjid from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, registration and requirements are posted on the screens. And also, and related to the khutbah as well, the Qur'an Institute is now enrolling students ages 5 and up, reading and pronunciation, hifz program, and a new class for special needs children and adults. All the different program details are on the lobby screens. Please make sure to stop by uh, and donate and support IOC on your way out or online via their website, IIOC. .com. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم فرج اللهم فرج هم المهمومين ونفس كرب المكروبين وقض الدين عن المدينين وش مرضانا ومرض المسلمين وارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه اللهم جعلنا من أهل القرآن اللهم جعلنا من أهل القرآن الذين هم أهلك وخاصتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أقم الصلاة